Hi, thank you for having me here today to share our work on temporal assessment of Eastern Spotted Skunk geographic distribution. Um, I am Amanda Cheeseman, and this is presented with my co-authors, Brian Tannis and Elmer Fink. So just to start, I'm sure we're all really familiar with the concept of the ecological niche, those biotic and abiotic conditions that allow for a species to persist in a given area. And these are things like climate or biotic habitat features like vegetation. Now, a species may or may not occupy the whole of its niche space, but what it does occupy defines its geographic distribution. And these geographic distributions tend to track these suitable environmental conditions on the landscape over time. Now, anthropogenic impacts over the last century have had dramatic impacts on climate and the landscape that are reflected in changing patterns of biodiversity and declines in many species as they're unable to adapt or shift their ecological niche in response to these changes. Species distribution models provide a powerful method to model species environmental relationships and provide an indicator of population status. Uh, for example, they've been widely used to track range expansions, particularly of invasive species, but also in response to management actions like translocations or habitat management. And likewise, they can also be used to assess range contractions, such as are commonly observed with declining populations. And these models can also be used to track shifts in the species distribution or environmental niche through time. And they're particularly useful as the models developed can be used to predict species distributions under future environmental scenarios or look into the past and estimate past distribution based on past environmental conditions. Even better, these models can incorporate presence only data, which is widely available in the form of museum records, many of which are historic and more modern community science observations. And then also in the form of backcasted and forecasted environmental data, such as climate data and land use data, which is becoming increasingly available. And as a result, these methods might be particularly beneficial for species like the Eastern Spotted Skunk, which have a lot of uncertainty surrounding changes in their populations and distribution through time. And they also tend to be highly cryptic. So we sought to determine if Eastern Spotted Skunks experienced a contraction in suitable area over the last century and also evaluate mechanisms that may have led to these potential contractions. Uh, with this, we specifically examined decreased landscape uh, diversity, increased habitat fragmentation, increased agricultural intensification, and decreased available forested habitat as drivers of environmental suitability. And we did this using species distribution models, as I just talked about. We used uh, museum records and research grade citizen science observations from 1931 to 2020 that we obtained from GBIF. And all of these records were examined for date, georeferencing, and taxonomic errors. And then we only kept records that had a coordinate uncertainty of less than 10 kilometers. After that, we spatially rarefied records to 10 kilometers to reduce issues with spatial autocorrelation in our models. And the final set of locations is shown here on the map on the right. We then paired each location with 100 pseudo-absence points, which were uh, randomly drawn and constrained to a convex hall around the eastern spotted skunk occurrences shown here. We used climate data from the PRISM group and calculated five metrics that we thought represented changes in agricultural intensity, available habitat, and landscape diversity and fragmentation. And we did this either from backcasted land cover data or national land cover database data, NLCB land 
uh, cover data. We then pair these points with the uh, environmental data from the closest year and extracted their time specific values to each skunk location or pseudo absence point. And then modeled species environmental niche using Maxim. We evaluated model parameters using the global model and then developed four other candidate models to test alongside the global model uh, that covered our hypotheses about agricultural intensity, habitat, and landscape diversity and fragmentation. We then went and evaluated these models and selected the final models based on three independent criteria um, listed here. Models were then used to predict landscape suitability for all of the 61 years that we had environmental data for. Um, that included the land use and climate data. And from these and the cross-validation blocks that we had, we created decadal ensemble maps for both continuous pre um, predicted suitability, so ranging from zero to one, or binary, which was either suitable or not suitable, based on this maximum sensitivity plus specificity threshold. And this is what gives us our maps of predicted suitability for different time steps. So in the end, we wound up with 184 Eastern Spotted Skunk records in our database. And this mounted to between seven and 34 uh, skunk locations per decade. And our model suggested that incorporating land use data in addition to climate data improved model fit with the model containing all the climate variables plus the amount of land and agriculture, the number of patches, landscape diversity, and average field size performing the best. When we examined what our uh, model predictions, our binary predictions, um, looked like by decade, what we found was that there was a trend towards uh, decreased landscape suitability over time. Um, so these here are, are again, binary ensemble um, predictions for each decade. Uh, calculating the amount of suitable area. And you can see that there seems to be a general decrease in suitable area over time. Just to kind of show you what that actually looks like on the landscape uh, here, starting with 1940 and progressing forward, what we can see is that areas are becoming less suitable overall. They're becoming cooler colored and the remaining suitable areas are becoming more fragmented. So if I can show you that again, we yeah, start with 1940s and moving forward, we see that the total amount of suitable area is decreasing, becoming more fragmented and just less suitable overall. So in total, uh, these decreases in suitable area that we see amounted to a 37% loss in suitable area across the model area between the 1930s and 2016. And you can see in the map on the right here, the areas with the greatest losses shown in the darker blues and the greatest gains shown in the darker reds uh, that the greatest losses, they occurred in the Great Plains region. And these losses in environmental suitability do correspond with the distribution of the plains spotted skunk. Uh, it's just that the loss of suitable niche may have been a contributing factor to their decline. Now you also notice that gains in suitability were greatest along their Western range boundary However, it should be noted that while these areas might be suitable, they might not be accessible or available for use by Eastern spotted skunks. And if this is the case, the 37% decrease in environmental suitability likely underestimates the decline in accessible, suitable habitat. Another interesting point was that land cover was an important contributor to the models. 
in particular landscape diversity, which might indicate a preference for edge habitat, the juxtaposition of multiple habitat types, and or just association with areas of lower agricultural intensification uh, by these skunks. Now, interestingly, we also found that forest cover was not important in the models. However, understory has been found to be important for eastern spotted skunks in forested environments. And I'd like to note that this was poorly represented in our models here. It's also worth noting that our models generally performed poorly throughout Appalachia, possibly because Appalachian spotted skunks have different habitat and environmental associations from plain spotted skunks. And this might be consistent with the recent findings that these are distinct species. So moving forward, I think that examining plains and Appalachian spotted skunks and these kinds of distribution models separately might improve model performance. And then conducting similar modeling exercises, but at finer scales that incorporate more data sources and account for variable detection rates could be highly beneficial for tracking contemporary range dynamics at scales that are relevant to habitat and species managers. And then lastly, while these data uh, were not available for our study, using similar methods to evaluate pre-1930s range could help test the early hypotheses of range expansion into the Northern Great Plains by plain spotted skunks um, and could be a very interesting question going forward. And so with that, I'd like to just acknowledge Fort Hayes State University for their support, as well as the museums that have curated these databases for public use. I'd like to thank um, the citizen scientists who take the time to uh, curate and catalog their data on a naturalist and GBIF for um, cataloging all of this in the centralized database. And I'd like to thank you all again for having me here and for listening to um, my talk on the research. Thanks. <laughs>